Why, hello there. Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools. On today's episode, you'll be able to see how we built this shed from start to finish, as well as what happened to it within the last year. Keep on watching. Let it started. It's been one year since I built this amazing shed and I personally wanted to give you some insight on what I would change as well as what actually occurred over the last year. Plus, because plenty of people asked for them, I made multiple shop drawings of different size sheds for the exact same style. So if you're interested in actually purchasing plans, check out the link in the description box below. I placed a video tag where you can see the shed changes, but for all the people that want to see how the shed is built, let's get right to it with the foundation. The ground that we have is extremely rooty due to the copious amounts of trees that we have in this backyard. So we're actually beefing up the front lip of the slab with a 2x6, but the remaining forms are 2x4s. After I have all boards attached to each other, I grab some wood stakes and hammer them in one corner specifically. Once I have those stakes positioned properly, I then drill the formwork into those stakes, securing that one corner, and proceed to making sure that this entire framework is fully square and level. The tried and true method when ensuring proper alignment is to just take a tape measure from one corner to the other and making sure that measurement is the exact same as the cross dimensional measurement. I'll go into more detail with this later. Once you finalize the slab positioning, I can then proceed to staking all other corners and making sure that every single side is level. As you can see, they all are. So I proceed to securing all the other stakes in each individual corner and then continue to some weed barrier. Now I'm certainly not worried about any of these weeds or roots coming through the concrete slab. However, a barrier is really nice because I'm actually gonna be applying some crushed rock on top of this surface and there's a nice differentiation between the soil and our crushed rock. This specific mixture is called 5 8 Crushed Minus and it's a perfect rock to use underneath a concrete slab because one, it's very easily compactable and two, it can still drain easily so any moisture that hits the concrete surface will easily be able to drain through. You do want to wet the rock before applying your concrete because if you don't, it may tend to dry out the bottom of your concrete making the concrete more prone to breakage or weakening down the road. I do decide to apply a bit of rebar around the perimeter of the concrete. This really doesn't need to be done for a slab this size. However, a little bit of extra strength always is a safe parameter in my book. But guess what? Now that we have our framework fully ready to go, it's now time for concrete. So let's pick up some concrete. The amazing thing about this little system is the fact that it's all connected to a hydraulic lift, which makes it extremely easy to lift, just know that it might get a little messy. If you don't have a lot of experience with concrete, don't feel intimidated by this step. It's very easy, as well as the fact that you use very simplistic, easy tools to work with, like a screed, which is just a 2x4 but sometimes the simple tools are the best tools to use. Just keep in mind when you are pouring, to try and lift that rebar up off the ground. I did prop up the rebar with a couple larger rocks, but you do want to make sure and go back to it to ensure that it's just not resting on that rock versus in the center of your concrete pour. I would suggest having a small screed that can get around the corners, as well as a larger screed that you can actually prop against both sides of the form, and therefore you can just go back and forth across the formwork to have a perfectly smooth surface, or at least as smooth as you're going to get with a 2x4. As a side note, I would highly suggest making some type of makeshift ramp, which allows you to avoid applying too much pressure to your concrete formwork. Once all the concrete is poured and screed, you can then proceed to your magnesium bowl float. Now this is obviously a very large magnesium bowl float, but it's perfect for a nice cohesive pass across this concrete slab. 
It brings up moisture and sand at the top of the surface, which really fills in all of those small little holes and crevices within your concrete before you apply your finished trowel. Now we didn't actually apply a finishing trowel to the surface just because it's a shed. We don't need to worry about how beautiful and pretty it is, but a nice cohesive bowl float across this entire surface does wonders when it comes to having a nice cohesive smooth surface in the end. Oh, and remember, you don't have to buy this thing. You could rent it for 10 to 15 bucks a day at most tool rental shops. Keep that in mind. And remember, when pouring a concrete slab, be prepared for doing something with the excess concrete if you expect to have some. We did, so we made a ramp. As for removing the formwork, you can generally remove the formwork within 24 hours. However, on this project, we did have some extra time, so I just let it sit here for over a week. Removing the concrete forms is straightforward and easy, and after you have them all removed, you can proceed to doing some layout. I personally am a very visual learner, so I do love actually going through the entire slab area and dictating exactly where my stud placements are going to be based upon where windows are, where doors are, and where the corners of our shed are. There are a number of things to think about when framing out a shed properly, and I'll go over plenty of them in this video. First things first, keep in mind that the studs need to be 16 inches on center. So if you have your tape measure, those little red marks at 16, 32, 48, and so forth actually mean something. Yes, that actually means that that's where your general stud placement is going to be. And working directly off of the slab really helps me personally because I can figure out exactly where each stud needs to be placed and it's gonna be an easy way to transfer those measurements onto our lumber. And speaking of lumber, let's get to cutting. In the Pacific Northwest, you're generally going to find dug fir 2x4s, but for the base cap of our walls, we're actually going to be using pressure treated lumber because if there's any chance of moisture getting to the studs themselves, the one area that it's going to be prone to is going to be at the very bottom, and that's why we're using pressure treated lumber, which will resist rot a lot better than your standard 2x4s. I cut both the top and bottom caps the same exact length and proceed to laying out those stud placements that I previously made on the slab. Once that is taken care of, I then cut down all of my studs for that specific wall down to 8 feet long and make sure that they're all set up at the same exact length. I actually set up a stop block which made life a little bit easier since I was able to measure once and then cut all of them at the same exact length. Once we have our studs lined up, we can proceed to nailing. And for nailing is one of my favorite tools, the framing nailer. This thing is heavy duty, has a kick, but is so satisfying to use. But just keep in mind, you wanna make sure you're extra careful with these guys because those nails can shoot out very quickly. So protect and make sure you're thinking about where your hands are when nailing, as well as eye protection. We wanted to make sure there was some type of daylight in this shed, so therefore we're actually going to be installing a window on the east side of the shed. And for windows and doors, you do want to account for a double stud layout, which basically constitutes you having a trim stud as well as a king stud on the far side. That way with any type of header you have overhead, it is properly supported with two studs on both sides. The header material that I'm using for this project is just some leftover 4x6 lumber that is not the prettiest lumber since I've had it lying around for a while, but it is very structurally sound, and that's the most important thing. Once the header's in, I can nail off the top cap and lean up our very first wall. I position the bottom plate where it needs to be, tack it in place with a couple supporting studs, and proceed to our second wall. The large factor to keep in mind on this specific project is that this is a lean-to shed style. It's not your normal gable or A-frame style where the tallest point in your roof is at the very center. Our tallest point on this shed is the first wall that we installed, and the second wall is going to be our shortest point. The main difference between the first wall and the second wall that we just fabricated is that the first wall had 8 foot tall studs, and the second wall only has 6.5 foot studs. Keep that in mind. As for the front and back walls, these are also six and a half foot tall studs, and you'll see why we do this in the very near future. It's mainly because we want to commingle these walls together with a top cap that connects all three. 
Once the back wall is in position, I level up both walls and just insert a couple nails to give this structure a bit of rigidity so we don't have to worry about this thing toppling over. I leave approximately 32 inches of space for the doorway and proceed to fabricate a couple panels for the front entryway and then fasten down the top cap just was a little bit easier for this stretch. At this point, we fasten down a second top plate, which is actually called a double top plate. This connects all three panels together and adds quite a bit of rigidity for this structure at this point. Don't be worried if it's not exactly perfect like this your very first time. Trust me, this is the beauty of video editing and it wasn't. That's why we have that pipe clamp in the corner just to suck it in a bit before we nail it in place. Once we have the double top plate fully fastened on the short side, we installed one on the tall side. And at this point, we are now ready for our roof rafters. These are two by sixes that are eight feet long. And once I like the positioning, I mark where it intersects with our double top plate and proceed to our bird's mouth cuts. Now, if you've never heard of a bird's mouth cut, in simplistic terms, it just allows your roof rafters to lay flush with your double top plates. Now this is where your speed square really comes in handy, so much so that in some areas, in some cases, this is actually called your rafter square. You lay your square flat against the rafter and you use the pivot point right there to determine the angle in which you need for your bird's mouth. Then you can grab your carpenter square and determine the other angle by running one side of your carpenter square against the line you just drew and pivot that where your other end point needs to be. This section is going to be a section where you're going to be cutting out, which is why I leave a mark there. And remember, you can also use this angle for the ends of your rafter if you want those ends to lay flush or 90 degrees when you have everything fully installed. We'll discuss that in more detail momentarily. Now, if you're not a big fan of math and you don't quite understand how to get that angle, I'll leave a link in the description box below on a calculator that's very easy. All you have to do is determine the actual rise versus run. So figure out how far the span is and determine the height difference between the two sides. In our case, we have a 78 inch wide run versus an 18 inch tall rise. That gives us a 13 degree angle, which is the exact dimension that I set my chop saw at, as well as the angle that I marked with my carpenter square when I originally drew this bird's mouth. I carefully use my circular saw as well as my jigsaw to cut out all of these bird's mouths evenly in every single roof rafter. But first, before you cut all these angles, I would highly suggest testing out your very first one to make sure it fits securely and properly. This is exactly what you want to see with this bird mouth because it's actually laying flush and flat against your double top plate which evenly distributes the weight on your top plate as well as just provides more stability and strength for these rafters. Now that we know that all of these measurements are good to go, we can then trace this exact dimension on all of our other rafters, which makes for determining the exact dimensions on all of them easy, just it might take a bit of time to cut all of these out. Keep that in mind. Once we have them all cut up and ready to go, I distribute them evenly on top of our structure and grab my header for the doorway. Now, I wasn't quite sure how I was gonna commingle this entire system together because we have very little space above our doorway to the above rafter, but no matter what, you still want to provide some type of structurally sound header above your doorway because of the sizable span that your door opening creates. Roof rafter layout is quite simple because we're mainly utilizing the spacing for the studs that we've already determined. One of my favorite brackets to use in this type of situation is these galvanized hurricane ties. Now this area certainly is not going to get much wind, but this really adds a lot of strength and stability as well as ease for installation and securing all of these rafters in place simply, cleanly, and evenly. However, on the ends, just keep in mind that you don't use the same type of bracket that you do in the middle sections. One of my all-time favorite tools to use with this application is a palm nailer because you can really get into some tight-knit spaces easily with a palm nailer. And all I'm doing is nailing inch and a half long nails into the brackets where it's indicated. 
At this point, we don't have any type of overhang on the front and back sides of our shed. Therefore, we need to install a sub fascia board. Now, this not only provides a lot of structural strength and stability for all of the rafters that are actually on the shed, but it also provides a much needed nice overhang for the front and the back of the shed. I nail the sub fascia board in place with all of the rafters and proceed to the top section as well. Same exact thing, same exact spacing. Once we have all of our hurricane ties fully installed, then we can proceed to some bracing above the doorway as well as the back of the shed. Now there's a few ways of going about doing this, but just know that the main angle that you're going to be using is the same exact angle that you already figured out, 13 degrees. Therefore you have the perfect alignment for the top of your rafters and then the bottom of the bracing is just a straight 90. On a normal doorway structure, you would be able to run a king stud past the header up into the top cap, but in this situation, we were not able to. However, I still wanted to provide some structural stability and strength at the doorway, so I did double up those studs on both sides. On the back of the shed, because we didn't have a header to worry about, I was able to run a horizontal beam across the end of the roof rafter, and therefore bracing on that side was very easy. After I had all of my wall bracing installed, I grabbed a couple more 2x6s and installed roof rafters on the ends of the shed. Now remember, this is the same exact size of all the other roof rafters, just remember, don't try and cut out any of your bird mouse on this section. At this point, we have the vast majority of the framing taken care of, and because of all of our due diligence with the framing itself, the structure itself is very level. Now, it's time to anchor this bad boy to the concrete. I grab my hammer drill with a half inch hammer drill bit and proceed to drilling through the base plate as well as the concrete itself. Then I insert our wedge anchor and hammer it in place. Now these wedge anchors are very handy and extremely strong when it comes to fastening things to concrete. After you hammer the wedge anchor in place, you can then grab your ratchet and tighten down the nut as much as humanly possible. I do the same exact process to every other bay within the structure as well as the corners in each corner of the shed. For the sheathing, we are using 4x8 plywood that is a half inch thick. For fasteners, we are using an inch and a half long exterior screw that provides plenty of strength and stability as well as you don't have to worry about it corroding over time because it's for exterior use, even for pressure treated lumber. I always find it a bit easier to fasten all the studs, especially the middle studs in place if I use a level and level out exactly where the center of those studs are. That way I can guarantee myself that I'm gonna be hitting studs in the dead center and we can all avoid those dreaded moments when you look inside and see, oh yeah, I missed a few. Keep in mind your fastener layout because it may change based upon where you live. Also note, your structure at this point may feel a little wobbly, and guess what, that's okay because if you've never built framing before, yeah, it feels a little wobbly after you have just the framing on, but once you fasten your sheathing to this structure, it's going to be rock solid and will not be swaying back and forth as you just saw. As for cutting our sheathing material, a circular saw is obviously the easiest tool to use, especially when you're considering these large panels. I actually made myself a makeshift track saw using two pieces of plywood. One piece is two inches wide, the other piece is eight inches wide, and that's all you need for a makeshift track saw. This thing really does make life a lot easier, especially when it comes time to cutting eight foot long sections, as you'll see right here because all you have to do is measure out two points at the front and the back side of the board, clamp down your tracking jig, grab your circle saw, cut off the excess, and you have a perfectly straight cut because of your tracking jig. Just makes life so much easier, and if you were to buy a track saw with the track itself, you're talking about hundreds of dollars, so we saved it because we just used scrap for ours. As for determining the angle of our roof rafters with the sheathing, I always find it easier to place it temporarily, draw a line on the backside, and then cut off the excess. I don't use a tracking saw here because it's just easier with small pieces like this, and as you see, we have a perfect fit and a perfect angle because we drew a line first. 
And as for drawing line templates, this also comes in extremely handy when you're applying sheathing over a window. We temporarily place the board upright, I strike a line around the entire window, lay down the plywood, and cut the appropriate cuts. I find the easiest way to do this is a plunge cut with your circular saw, but if you don't feel comfortable enough to do that, you can always just drill holes in the corners and use your jigsaw to cut the remainder with the appropriate lines. I do stop short with my circular saw and use my jigsaw in the corners just because I don't want unnecessarily long cuts in my plywood. One thing to also keep in mind is that you do want some type of small space in between each panel for expansion and contraction. I would say an eighth inch between the panels is always advisable. And if you don't wanna do this just by hand, you can always get some sheathing clips which actually does this for you and makes life just a little bit easier, which is always nice. I'll leave a link in the description box below on where you can actually purchase these, but just note that these may not be provided at your local hardware store, which is what happened to us. As for the roof rafters, there are a couple things we could have done here. Specifically, we could have actually enclosed them so you didn't see them, but we wanted to keep them open so you could see them, but we didn't want an open airway for rodents or birds to get into, which is exactly why we cut notches for our roof rafters in every single panel that we installed. This is actually a really nice way to enclose this entire side, and it's gonna be a perfect surface for us to fasten our siding to. This may look like a bit of extra work, but it really didn't take too long, especially with a jigsaw and my speed square. I could make very precise, even cuts along the way, and they don't have to be perfect because you're never gonna see this panel, at least on the exterior. After we notched the short side of the shed, we notched the tall side of the shed. Same exact process, just a smaller panel, which is a lot more manageable than large panels. Also, don't worry if these panels don't fit perfectly the very first time, they didn't for us just the beauty of video editing. The main key to sliding them in place the very first time was to just cut them an eighth of an inch larger on both sides. After we have all the sheathing taken care of on the walls, we can proceed to the sheathing on the roof. Now the only difference between this material and the wall sheathing is the fact that this material is three quarters of an inch thick, and as I noted before, the wall panels are only a half inch thick. Because our roof is eight feet by 12 feet, this means three sheets is all you need for this entire structure. Just note that one piece is slightly darker than the rest because that's been my parents' garage for probably a couple decades. Okay, we're just relaxing on top of the roof doing some sheathing. Now, this sheathing, we got one full piece right here in the dead center, and we have two other pieces that are gonna go on that end and this end, but we're just gonna cut them at three feet and five feet sections because that will constitute exactly the space that we have for our joists on this side as well as that side. Yeah, it might've been a little bit nicer if we could have just done three full sheets, but we had to cut them basically in half to make sure everything fits, but everything does fit with three sheets, just two cuts. As for fastening and spacing, it's the same exact process as the walls. Try and leave approximately an eighth inch between the panels. Not always doable because I want to hit as much roof rafter as possible, especially on the ends. But just keep in mind spacing, fastening schedule, as well as the material you're using. Because this is an exterior sheathing, you do want to check out local building code and see specifically if an exterior rated sheathing is appropriate in your area, specifically for a shed. We start off this waterproofing process with an appropriate drip edge. This drip edge is gonna be around the entire perimeter of our plywood and I notch out the corners appropriately so it can bend around each corner and stay flush against the plywood. That provides a really nice finished look and there's a couple different ways of actually notching this out. I did it this way, but you can obviously do it any way you so desire. Just keep in mind that you don't want this to be a weak point in your system and having the flashing fold onto itself really encapsulates that corner so there's no possible way of moisture intruding at that point, especially if you tape it off afterwards. The bottom of the plywood should already be level because we leveled out everything already, but just in case, I do suggest grabbing a six foot or four foot level to ensure that this entire channel is fully level as you install it across the underside of the shed. To properly fasten this flashing to the plywood, I'm using galvanized flathead nails in order to have a proper structural bond as well as not having to worry about any type of corrosion 
over time. Applying an acrylic flashing tape at this point is also very important just because of the fact that you're sealing in that top edge, but you're also encapsulating all of those nail heads that you just fastened because those are penetrations into your shed. And if you didn't cover up those penetrations, that may be a weak point over time. There's plenty of flashing tapes out there, but this specific one is called G-Tape. I love this product because I've used it numerous times, as well as the fact that for some reason I just love saying G-Tape, G-Tape, yeah, G-Tape. The corners of a shed or even a house really seem like they take on the most damage over the years, and therefore I'm applying a heavier duty six inch membrane around all corners of the shed. This will just guarantee that we have less water intrusion potential in the future, and it solidifies those corners nicely and evenly with a heavy duty membrane, which is just comforting in my eyes. Keep in mind that when you do apply this to the surface, make sure you overlap on top of the G-tape as well as the metal flashing if you like. That way any moisture that hits this tape will then hit the G-tape or the flashing and roll off. In theory at least. Now that we have our corners taken care of, it's now time for our Tyvek house wrap. This specific house wrap is a three foot wide roll and I'm just fastening it at the very top with a staple gun. With larger house projects, you would want to fasten a lot more than just one small row on the very top. However, because this is a shed and a small-ish project, I'm not worried about this stuff blowing away anytime soon. So a simple row at the very top fastening as well as stapling it to the corners is fine by me, especially when you consider the fact the less penetrations in your membrane, the better. As I apply the second row of Tyvek, I also overlap the seam approximately six inches. That's based upon what they would recommend highly on a project like this, and just assures that we have plenty of overlap for all of our seams. After I have the entire house wrapped with Tyvek, I then go back with G-Tape and tape off any middle sections of the seams. Okay, we have the shed fully wrapped out. Now Tyvek, we have it basically protruding at the bottom here, but I didn't actually tape this because if there is, for some reason, any moisture that gets back here, I wanna make sure it can actually drain out and actually repel it on the drip edge. So just keep that in mind. Everything else though is taped out on all seams. Six inches of overlap over here. And now we did have to get a little creative in some cases up the top, but inevitably just tape it off, make it look good at least as good as possible. Also, we have to now do the door and the window. So let's get to that. Cutting the tie bag back from the window is quite simple and straightforward. The main way I think about it is a picture frame. You cut a 45 degree mitered edge on all four corners and you actually cut even deeper on the top lip. And you'll see why we do that here shortly. I staple off all the excess Tyvek on both sides as well as the bottom, and then apply our heavy duty membrane flashing on the very bottom of our sill. This is a six inch membrane, so any excess we want to have overlapping on the front side because we're gonna bend it down and it's just gonna add extra weatherproofing strength and support. With some flashing tapes, you can just bend it down, but with this one, it's a bit more heavy duty and therefore I had to cut it back. But where I cut it back, I did apply excess membrane flashing in those specific corners. At this point, our opening is prepped and ready for our window. And before we install it, I do suggest applying a 100% silicone on the top as well as the sides of the window. Don't apply it to the bottom window flange, just the sides and the top, because that way, if there is any moisture, it can still drain out through the bottom. It won't be trapped. And therefore, if the moisture is trapped, there's going to be a higher probability of decay over time. Go ahead and insert the window into position and just keep in mind I have a quarter inch of extra space on all four sides. Once the window is positioned and shimmed correctly, I proceed to fasten it on the sides as well as the top of the window. Again, no penetrations at the bottom because those areas are more prone to moisture. I apply a strip of membrane flashing on both sides first and then apply a strip on the very top that overlaps the two sides. 
Once all that flashing is in place, I then flip over the Tyvek flap on the very top, cut off any of the excess, and apply a second layer of membrane flashing in order to completely conceal this entire flange. Just don't forget about the corners as well. After we have the window taken care of, we can then make our way to our door. And for the door, same thing, cut off a mitered corner on both sides, stretch up the top, and staple the sides in place. Once we have that in order, we come to our door. And as for our door, there are a number of doors to choose from. This specific door is actually a door that we just had in the garage laying around, just like a number of different things in my parents' garage. We cut the door and the door jam to the appropriate size, and as you can see, this is an interior door, which is a mistake. I would highly suggest using an exterior door because at the very end, I'll show you what happened to this door a year later. I first double checked to make sure that this door actually fits, and it might be a little tight, but it did fit quite nicely, just took a couple taps. For a door like this, waterproofing is also very important. And to ensure we don't have any moisture intrusion issues, we apply a membrane flashing over all three sides, obviously not including the bottom side of the door. We do this by attaching two pieces of membrane on each side. One specific piece is being adhered to the surface of the door first, and then the other piece is adhered to the flashing, but it is also stuck out proud a couple more inches, and therefore that side is going to be adhered to the Tyvek house wrap, as you can see right here. This provides a very nice and even seal all the way around the door, and therefore protecting it for years to come. The top membrane flashing is basically exactly what we did with the window because we're going to be applying the membrane flashing first underneath the Tyvek house wrap, then unfold the Tyvek house wrap on top, overlapping the membrane. You can then shim out the door as needed, making sure that everything is straight, fasten the door in place, double check making sure that everything has stayed level, and if so, go ahead and fasten the remaining fasteners for your door. Now that the door casing is fully secured, I remove the door and cut off approximately a quarter inch at the very bottom of the door. That way it's free to move and you won't have to worry about it dragging on your concrete. Oh, and don't forget to seal up your Tyvek above your door afterwards. We can now move on to our membrane flashing on our roof. This is the same waterproof membrane that we use on the corners of our shed as well as the door and window. You first want to apply this membrane to the lower side of the roof shed first, then fold in the corners and start applying it to the sides. That way you can overlap your membrane on the bottom side and after the sides are installed, you can then apply it to the top surface of your roof. If you're wondering why we're overlapping this entire project the way we are, just keep in mind gravity is key with this respect. All rain slash moisture is going downward, so anything that hits the top of the surface, you want it to drain off of that onto your next flashing, onto your next flashing. If it's actually overlapping the opposite way, it potentially might have more prone to having that moisture be sucking into the house versus repelling away from the house. Keep that in mind because there is a reason for this overlapping madness. Now that our membrane corners are installed, we can now install our roofing felt. This is a 30 pound roofing felt, which is a heavy duty roofing material, and it really does an amazing job at repelling any type of moisture away from our plywood. I'm using three quarter inch long galvanized flathead nails because that way any type of nail that I'm penetrating into the plywood will not be seen from the underside. It's just not a good look when you're walking into a shed when you look up and see a bunch of nails coming out, even if it's a shed, because we want to build it the right way. I tack the roofing felt in place by nailing it on the sides as well as the very top strip of the felt. Once the first row is in, I then overlap it with a second row of felt. The overlap is approximately four inches, and the nice thing about the overlap is that you're covering up all of those penetrations that you just did on that top row. You obviously can't cover up the last row of fasteners, but that's where the membrane comes in because once this final sheet of felt is in place, I then take small strips of our membrane flashing and cover up every single nail with that. That way we can ensure that there's very little likelihood of any moisture getting underneath this felt through our penetrations. 
Now I know waterproofing is not the most entertaining portion of any project, but it's so vitally important to this project and now we can move on to trim. And the first thing we're getting to is the exterior trim. We're using four inch by five quarter inch PVC trim from ASIC. This is their ASIC Paint Pro trim, which is an extremely high quality PVC trim that actually is designed specifically to accept paint. Not all PVC trims do that. And the reason why we're using this type of trim is because it's completely 100% waterproof and mold slash rot proof, which is exactly what we want, especially in areas where we have a high amount of moisture and it's more prone to rotting over time if we were using a standard wood trim. This product is very easy to cut with your standard general purpose saw blade. And if you want to get in those small tight knit corners like I did to notch things out, I did use my jigsaw, which also cut nicely. One of my favorite things about this trim series is the fasteners itself. They are called Azek Cortex fasteners and I've actually used them on multiple decks. The really nice thing about this product is the fact that it's designed specifically for composite materials and it comes with plugs which will be plugging all of these holes very shortly. As for trimming out a doorway, I always find it easier to trim out the sides of the door first, making sure that you have it centered on the door casing on the sides as well as centered on the top of the door casing. That way you know for certain you have the right spacing, then you can take your measurement for your top cap and cut that at the exact length. Once I have my door taken care of, I then proceed to the window. And for the windows, I also do like to start with the sides first, get those positioned and installed correctly, and then start installing the bottom and the top plate after that. One thing to keep in mind with the window itself is the fact that you are having to deal with the window flange, which does make things a little uneven sometimes. So if you have to insert a couple small shims on the side in order for the trim to lay flush against the house, that's not gonna be a big deal. Just put a couple shims and make it straight. For added waterproofing and protection, I do highly recommend installing some Z flashing right above your trim top cap on your window as well as your door. This will provide easy drain off for any moisture that hits the window or the door. Also, after you nail it in place, make sure you apply a small strip of G tape for added waterproofing protection. This ASIC Paint Pro trim series also has fascia boards. So we picked up some five quarter inch by eight inch boards that will go around the entire perimeter of our roof rafters. From part one and two, you know our roof is approximately a 312 pitch, which means we have approximately a 13 degree mark that we're gonna be cutting our angles out, at least for the fascia boards that are gonna be going on the front and the back side of the shed. We found that the easiest way to get perfect alignment is to actually install a scrap board on both sides of the shed. That way we know exactly how far we need to actually protrude out, then make a mark and cut the panels that way. Then pre-drill a few fasteners so you're not trying to attach the fastener while it's hanging on the side, which makes life just a little bit easier, which is always appreciated. Especially when you're hanging over a tall structure, or at least tall-ish. The beauty about this fastening system is the fact that they come with these plugs that match the grain structure perfectly as long as you put them in the correct direction of the grain and then gently hammer them in place. It almost completely hides all of the fasteners that you just put in and you're still able to remove these later on if need be. Now that we have the trim taken care of, it's now time for siding. And for siding, we are using ASIC's shingle siding with Paint Pro technology. So basically the same exact product as the trim itself, just in large shingle sheets. With the siding, there are specific directions to get it installed properly. And the first step is to actually cut small one and a half inch strips, as well as larger nine inch sections for the starter course. Now these small tabs can be used later on, but the panels are the real items that we're working with first. The main tool that you're really gonna want to have on this job is a nail gun, more specifically a siding coil nailer, but in our circumstance, we are actually using a roofing coil nailer. 
the main reason why we're doing this is because siding nailers really don't have nails that are less than an inch and a quarter and we actually need three quarter inch and one inch long nails in order for us to not pierce the inside of our sheathing because we're not gonna be actually finishing or putting any type of drywall or anything else on the interior of the shed, I don't wanna be looking at the interior of the shed seeing hundreds of nails coming out. Keep that in mind because these nails might differ in length due to the material that you use for your sheathing. As a spacer, we're using one of our starter strips at the very bottom of our drip edge, then laying our starter strip on top of that and nailing it in place. We also utilize this spacer for our nine inch starter course. Nailing the starter strip and course is fairly straightforward. Just make sure the tabs on your starter course is facing up, not on the bottom. Once it's time to install your shingle panels, the one thing you need to keep in mind with a PVC product is the fact that you either need to apply a small dollop of adhesive on the very bottom of each tab, or after they're all installed, nail them in place. Because I want as few penetrations going into our drip edge as possible, I do decide to use the Azek Fill and Flex adhesive, which is specifically designed for this type of PVC product, but I only do it for the first row. All the other ones, I'll nail them in place after all the shingles are in place. You'll see what I mean shortly. As for cutting these shingles down, it's hard to cut this 16 inch long strip in one long pass, which is why I cut each shingle with two passes. The first cut is on your tab side because that's where people are actually gonna see the shingle, but the second pass is on the top side because that's where your shingle overlap is gonna be, and even if you screw up on that cut, no one's gonna see it. At first, I thought I was gonna use a laser level for the entire leveling portion of this project, but quickly realized the laser level was just not stable enough and there was gonna be a lot of work needed to do that, which is why a beautiful chalk line, which is much less of a headache, is perfect for this application. I mark points on both sides approximately seven inches away from each other and then snap a chalk line, which provides a perfect straight line all the way across. As far as nailing is concerned, you wanna stay within a half inch to an inch above where each slot is in the shingle. If you go too high, you might bend the shingle sheet awkwardly, but if you go too low, you might have a chance of breaking through into the tab itself. And you're supposed to be nailing right above each tab as well as the ends. I did go high in some areas, but after I got the hang of it, it was really consistent all the way across. Okay, so now that we got the whole rigor removal down, I will explain. So each section gets a full piece, which is 48 inches, then a 32, then a 16. But you gotta remember, each one is a, f is a fresh piece. You can't just cut it at 32 inches and see you have a 16 and a 32 because you need this little guy right there, right there, and right there because that's where the fresh piece starts. And if you don't, then all these tabs will at a certain point align together and it won't look good. So make sure fresh cut from this corner over here, 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 and then the scrap goes on that side. Easy enough. As we work our way up to the top of our shed, we do run into all of our roof rafters. And because this is gonna be one beautiful shed, we need to notch every single one out. And I assure you, there's no half-assing on this project, which is why we're gonna be notching out every single one of our shingles in order to bring the shingles up to the very top of our roof rafters. Might take a little extra time to do this, but this really does provide a beautiful and professional finished look in the end. Use your chop saw to cut each side, then score the very bottom, break it off, and guess what? You got a perfect piece for each specific rafter. But just keep in mind that just because the top of this shingle sheet made it to the top of the roof rafters doesn't mean we're done because we have to cover all of these nail holes again with another row, which again takes a little extra time but provides a beautiful professional look in the end. 
However, at this point and for this row, we are actually using a finish nailer to nail off these sheets and any other correlating top pieces that we install because any nail that we shoot into at this point will be seen later on. As we move on to the other sides of the shed, it's basically the same exact process, but on the front side, because it's such a small section, I do try and use up some of the scrap, which did get a bit tricky when trying to avoid the grooves running into each other. Just keep that in mind if you do have small sections that you have to account for and can't use full pieces. When notching around a window or any other item, the easiest way to determine how much you have to cut off is to basically account for how much space you have as the reveal and then determine how much space you still need. For example, if I only have five inches of reveal on the bottom section and I need seven, that means I need to cut off two inches on the top portion of the shingle. Hopefully that made sense, and if it doesn't, please let me know in the comments section below. When installing siding around a window or a door, the one thing to be mindful of is the fact that because you don't have the siding butting up next to each other on each side of the door or window, means you have to be very accurate with your spacing on both sides because you don't want to get to the very top of the door or window and all of a sudden things don't line up properly. To make life easier, I did strike a line across the very bottom of the window, which basically provides a perfect measuring layout across both sides of the window so I don't have an odd spacing between the two sides once I get above the window. As for the angle needed at the very top of the shed in the front and the back, just remember we can use that 13 degree mark that we've used previously, and if we need to cut it in a very large section, we can always draw a line and use the table saw to cut a crisp line all the way down the panel. Not the easiest thing to do, but it works. I wanted to say a big special thank you to the ASIC team because they actually did provide all the ASIC materials for this project and I personally actually loved working with it. The fact that you have products like this that come from recycled materials that are 100% waterproof and have a lifetime warranty, you can't beat that and I absolutely love the finished look on this shed. I'll leave a link in the description of this video on where you can learn more about this product as well as where you can actually purchase this product if you are interested in your next project. And as I noted before, after we have all the shingles in place, I do go back and finish nail every single tab in every single corner in order to fasten and secure each tab in place. I did have to install over a thousand nails in just this one application alone, but in all honesty, this was more satisfying than anything else because you were really securing every single tab down, and because it's a finish nailer, you're able to run that gun like none other and get it taken care of probably within an hour. Once you have everything fully secured, you do want to apply some type of caulk or paintable silicone around all the corners as well as the doors and windows, especially the doors and windows. These are going to be areas where it's more prone to moisture and using a good quality caulk or silicone that is paintable is key, especially when avoiding any type of moisture getting into the framework of the structure. I'm using a product that is actually paint ready in 30 minutes because guess what? I wanna start painting. And for painting, I wanna apply a good quality primer first to any bare wood. The bare wood is gonna be actually right underneath a roof as well as the roof rafters, of course. Because we're working overhead and it's gonna be difficult to get into some of these tight knit areas with a paintbrush, I decided to actually spray on the primer, which will make life a lot easier to get into all those miscellaneous corners. For the sprayer itself, I'm using the Wagner Flexio 3000, which I've actually used in multiple videos. And keep in mind with any primer, you do want to check and make sure that it can actually also be applied to vinyl or PVC. We're not trying to prime our siding, but there's going to be obvious overspray since it's so close to the roof rafters. As for paint, we're going with Duration by Sherwood-Williams. This is a color that we actually used previously on the house, and the only thing you have to make sure of is that it can also be applied to vinyl or PVC products. 
This specific mixture does, and just like I did with the primer, I do add a small amount of water to the mix and mix it thoroughly in the sprayer. That way it just slightly reduces the viscosity of the paint and makes spraying a little bit easier. Having a sprayer like this really does make quick work of a project of this size. The one thing to keep in mind is the fact that I also want to spray this because it makes it a lot easier to get into some of those tight knit corners in the shingles itself. Because those shingles have small slits down the side, it is sometimes difficult to get paint in there with just a paint brush. But with a sprayer, you're really able to get in there nicely and evenly. After I spray, I do back brush all the shingles as well as those crevices, mainly because I want a nice consistent look of paint all the way across. And having a paint brush just to get into those tiny nitty gritty areas definitely helps in the long run. Takes a little bit of extra time, but well worth the effort if you want a beautiful finish. Now I didn't paint the corners of the shed because I actually wanted to use the corners to prop up my ladder to get up in tight knit areas and spray those down without having to worry about screwing up the finish of the paint. Then once all the shingles were painted, I then went back and painted those corners evenly all the way across. As for the door, window, and fascia trim, we're actually going to be painting that a different color, which also matches the house paint. Just know that with black paint, you'll probably have to use two coats. And luckily for us, our metal roofing system finally showed up, so let's get that installed. This specific product is from New Ray, and the nice thing about their product as well as our shed is the fact that we didn't have to do any cuts with these panels. Each panel is approximately 36 inches wide, and they custom fit the length of these panels to the exact size of the shed, which is approximately 100 inches. There is also four trim pieces that we need to install, and the first one is called the Hook Eve trim piece. This basically acts as your drip edge for the entire roof structure as all of the rain and moisture that hits this roof is gonna be repelling down towards your hook eave. I nail that off with three quarter inch galvanized nails and then align my panels as needed. I basically align every single panel with the front of the hook eave and then fasten a couple screws in place just to secure the first panel. These screws are specifically designed for this system and they actually have a heavy duty washer on the bottom side, therefore there's no chance of moisture getting underneath the screw head. Once I tag the first panel in place a couple times, I then get on top of the roof and install a few screws on the very top portion of every other panel. That will ensure there's no movement of these panels as I'm walking across them, and I would strongly suggest running a chalk line across the middle section of the panels in order for all of your fasteners to be lined up properly. Yeah, I know, no one's gonna see the top of the shed most likely. No matter what, I want all these fasteners to be aligned perfectly across this roof. It's the little things that count sometimes. As you just saw, I stuffed foam trim in between the hook eave and the roofing panels. This foam is specifically designed for this system and it prevents moisture from getting into the top surface as well as any other rodents or other unique items that want to climb up into these channels. And as you can see clearly here, you do want to overlap these channels so they're actually connected into each other and that's how these panels are hooked together and avoid any moisture from getting up underneath them. In these specific locations, you fasten both sides into the plywood as well as one faster through the top of each panel. There are also foam strips that correlate to the top of the roofing panels as well, but to make sure that they stay in place, I do apply a bit of roofing sealant to the top of the panels and then stick the foam in place. That way they won't move on me, especially while I'm maneuvering the trim over the top of the foam. The trim over the front as well as the back of the shed will be the next two pieces that we install. And for these two pieces, I left the lower end at a 90 degree angle exactly the way it came, but I cut the top section at the appropriate angle based upon my fascia. I'm using a grinder with a metal cutting blade to cut these sections, but you can also use your standard metal cutting snips. I make a mark approximately every 10 inches and secure a fastener on both the top as well as the lower lip level. This fully secures the metal gables in place and due to the overlap on the roof, there's no way of water penetration underneath the metal panels. 
As for our last and final piece of trim, it's called out as the ridge cap. And for the ridge cap, we actually need to do a bit of cutting and molding to make sure it fits snugly in place while also ensuring that no moisture is gonna get through. We need to make a finished end cap on both sides. And the easiest way of going about this is to make a one inch mark on both the top and bottom of the flashing. Once you have that taken care of, figure out how wide your gable is, which in our case is four and a half inches. I make that mark on the top section, and then I make a cross dimensional line from our four and a half inch gable mark to our one inch line. Once we have that, we can then grind or snip our way to that corner and cut that section off completely. However, keep in mind that we're only removing this side of the flashing. We're not gonna be removing the other side, we're just gonna be bending the other side in place. That way, both pieces will be able to connect nicely with our gables once we position them properly. To make our bend a little bit more even, I use a piece of wood to prop up on the finish side, as well as a clamp wrench to evenly distribute the bend properly on the entire seam. I apply a bit of roofing sealant into the crack so we know there's not going to be any leaks along the way, as well as a few fasteners. And as you can see, it's not the most beautiful, perfect seam that you can possibly imagine, but it protects the structure and it doesn't leak, which is exactly what we want at this point. Once we have that accounted for, go ahead and fasten all of your fasteners on the top ridge of your metal roof. And guess what? We are done! This is one extremely well-built shed, one that I'm sure will last for decades, and it's not only extremely functional, but it's beautiful at the same time. But like I said, this is a culmination video of last year's video, and if you want to see what it turned out like a year later, well, here you go. Obviously quite a few tree needles that will probably need to be brushed off eventually, but still extremely structurally sound and no water intrusion whatsoever. However, there are a few things that we had to add. Number one being some ventilation, because this shed actually smelled a little musty, especially in the depths of winter, and therefore to make sure we didn't have any mold issues, we inserted these vents on both sides of the shed, which allowed airflow to go in and out of the shed freely. I also made sure that we had something to suck up any extra moisture if it did gradually find its way in. And like I said previously, do not use an interior door at this location because this is what's going to happen. This small section is actually made out of MDF and it's breaking down extremely quickly. The door still shuts properly, but we'll replace the entire unit in one foul swoop. I also want to show off how we installed some much needed shelving within the space and that's where wall control comes in. This is an extremely nice high quality pegboard system that's made here in the United States and as such I will also make sure we have a link in the description box below on where you can find this specific system. I level out each panel, pre-drill my holes, and install the appropriate screws and this panel system is extremely secure and can hold plenty of weight. In areas where the hole placements on the paneling didn't match up with my stud locations, I just put a couple strips of plywood in those locations and then secured the panels to that. The great thing about this paneling system also is the fact that it has multiple different types of accessories to choose from, such as heavy duty brackets that can hold a lawnmower, smaller things that can hold my weed whacker, and of course plenty of other accessories for all of my other tools. I fill up the remaining shelving with plenty of other exterior tools like snow shovels, a normal shovel, brooms, rakes, and so forth. Plus a couple shelves that can hold a considerable amount of weight. This is the perfect way to finish off this amazing shed project. And as I noted before, if you want shop drawings, there are multiple sizes to choose from right now. And if you don't see the right size that you're looking for, let me know in the comment section because if there's enough people that want it, I'll make it. Now that is one beautiful, sexy beast of a shed. Oh yeah.